Sometimes a great tale requires travel, and this particular tale began in Melbourne, Victoria. It was to be a tale that would leave me changed for the remainder of my life. Pentridge Prison was opened in 1851 and closed in 1997. Nowadays, 75% of the prison has been demolished or scheduled for development. All that remains is D Division, the Remand and Sentencing Classification Wing. Pentridge Prison has always been a place of fear, punishment and oppression. Through recently discovered letters written between 1983 and 1987, we get a real perspective of what it was like to be a prisoner in Pentridge. It was one of Australia's toughest prisons. September 21st, 1983. Dear Sis, by now you probably know I was arrested for stealing a car, marijuana and theft and I've been stuck in Pentridge waiting to be sentenced. Well, I've been sentenced to three years in this hellhole, and even though the time I spent on remand was taken into account, it doesn't make me feel any better about it. The cells are freezing cold, and you're stuck in them for 16 hours a day, but at least in the cell I don't have to be around the rest of the prisoners, which is when all the shit happens in here. I hope you write back, as I know Melbourne is too far for you to visit, and letters are the only thing that keeps me going in here. In the 1980s, Pentridge was not a place that you wanted to find yourself in, but it was very easy to find yourself in Pentridge. Many people came here cutting out fines. If they couldn't afford to pay their fines, they did time in jail. Not all of them even made it. Some fell victim to prison violence, others had experiences that it took them their whole lives to get over. December 23rd, 1983. Dear Sis, we are all in lockdown in our cells at the moment. A bunch of crims got on the piss with some home brew and have rioted in the wing. The noise in here is unbelievable. The locked up crims are shouting out, banging on the trap, as well as the sound of sirens and fighting. I can hear the news reports on the radio, so at least we know what's going on. Looks like another shit Christmas. It's the silly season, the home brews were in, uh, in vogue, and unfortunately four of them got on it and uh, uh, obviously couldn't hold their drink. Well, the hosing down didn't turn out to be uh, a success. In fact, if anything, it made the roof a lot more dangerous. The officers caught them at the bottom and uh, saved them from further injuries. And they went down at such a speed that they missed the guttering. It's a flashpoint, very explosive. You're given the order to go up and you just go up. I mean, you haven't the time to uh, think of the odds that are involved in it, but. Uh, to their credit, they got up on the roof and they got the prisoners down. As I write this letter, I feel good and fail. You're serving your sentence in Pentridge Jail. Though they say you're guilty, I know that's not true That's why I still pray love There were absurd breaks from the daily routine such as the TV show Prisoner putting on a concert for the real prisoners on live television I'm terribly sorry, ladies, but I couldn't help but notice that there was, well, there was something lacking in the number. Yeah, bloke. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't that. It, it lacked, well, it was lacking a bit of panache. A what? Panache. Ah, oh, I've got more of that in me little finger than you've got in your whole bloody body. No, explain. Right here is where the division bell used to hang. And six times a day, the circle officer would ring the bell and he'd shout, 
Muster up! And all the prisoners would lie up, ready to be counted. This is the yard bill itself. Four prisoners would be housed in here and they would be let out after all of the other prisoners are locked up to go into the yards and hose them down. Prior to this being the yard bill itself, it was in fact the hangman's cell. And right here was bars. And on this side of the room, a prison officer would sit. And on the other side of the room, the condemned man would sit for the final hours before he was taken out the front here and hung. This is the spot where in fact the prisoners were hung. Uh, in, the trapdoor has now been taken away and they've put a rather theatrical looking rope hanging from the beam. But it was indeed the very spot where many prisoners ended their days at the end of a rope. Apparently we're more enlightened these days. Well, in these cells, things were pretty basic. Um, they didn't have plumbing. So uh, it was a shit bucket, which you'd empty out every two days. Very attractive. You can see where the toilet used to be plumbed into this cell and back in the day prisoners would uh, put a blanket over the top of the toilet, pump out all the water and they'd use it as a telephone to talk to the cells downstairs. It was also very useful for getting a line of string and feeding it down the toilet and you could transport contraband from one cell to another. So this uh, cell would house up to six prisoners and uh, in these kind of quarters it was pretty tight. Here in D Division, that end of the division was called Collins Street, and this end was called Burke Street. Right here was the Chief's Office. So every morning, if you had a request, you'd have to put your name down on Governor's request on a little slip of paper, and it would come to the Chief. You'd then line up out the front here, and one at a time, you'd go in and he'd hear your requests. Most of the time, whatever you're asking for, it was no. Right here is where many a card game would have been played. Prisons played for cigarettes, loose tobacco, extra food, maybe a can of drink. And if you cheated, it was a very, very dangerous thing. This is where uh, all prisoners would shower, in full view of all the other prisoners in the yard, and of course, the guards in the tower. It was the same for the toilets, not much privacy. That was all that blocked you from the rest of the yard and the prison officers up in the tower. Third of January, 1984. Dear Sis, I got a job today. I'm now one of the yard billets, which means I hose out the yards after lockup, and the mess left behind is bloody disgusting. But at least it gives me time by myself, outside when all is quiet. It's quite peaceful, and there's not much of that in here. In Pentridge, a trustee was known as a billet, and uh, the best job in the prison was the yard billet. Yard billets would get to come out to these yards after all the other prisoners had been locked away and hosed them. And because everyone was locked up at around about three o'clock in the afternoon, having that job meant that you were the only one who had a chance to see a sunset. This is where the hot water urn would be kept, thus ensuring that every prisoner could have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee throughout the day. 
It was also handy for collecting boiling water to throw at other prisoners. Right here was where the prison radio station would be housed. A prisoner called Sparrow used to run the radio station and what would happen is that visitors could leave a little slip of paper with a request and a message to their loved one which they'd leave after they had their visits. They'd all be given the Sparrow right here and he would announce them over the radio and play those requests. It was quite often the only comfort and touch of home the prisoners had here at Data Vision. One of the most important parts of prison life was getting letters from home. And every afternoon, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Glassy, who was the mailman, would come around and he'd do mail calls. Mr. Glassy was a very kind, gentle and Christian soul who always had a kind word for every prisoner. He always said that he would never turn the key on another man, which is why he remained mailman for Pentridge Prison for his entire career. Just down here was where the prison hospital used to be and the chief medical officer, Mr Siemens, was famous for telling prisoners, if you have a heart attack, I'm going to let you die because I'm not putting my mouth on yours. Such was the level of care here in Pentridge. June 27th, 1984. Dear Sis, I only hope your children don't do anything like I did. I wouldn't want them to end up here. Tell them from me. Jail is not a nice place, and you can lose your identity very easily. Let me explain. I've recently spent a month in H Division, nicknamed Hell Division, as it is a solitary and punishment unit. I was there as a result of being bashed over a packet of cigarettes, and when I refused to give up the names of the blokes that got me, classification sent me to H to put pressure on me as well as hide my injuries from the public view. No visits, you see. When I came back to the division, I was put back in the yards with the other prisoners. I wasn't used to being around others, and I was shaking uncontrollably. It took me two days merely to talk to others. That month in H Division demonstrated to me what jail can do to you, if you let it. So if you ever come across a smart-mouthed kid who's heading for trouble, tell them about H Division. That'll scare the shit out of them. October 29, 1987. Dear Sis, we're in lockdown again, and I write this letter not knowing if I'll see you again. Earlier we could hear alarms going off and screws running through the division, and now I've just heard on the radio that Pentridge is on fire. I don't know where the fire is, but it must be close. I can smell the smoke coming in the cell window, and I can hear heaps of sirens and helicopters overhead. Everyone keeps banging up, but the screws are ignoring us. I wonder if they'll let us out of our cells, or will we be cooked like rabbits in an oven? All I can do is wait and listen to the radio. I don't want to sound melodramatic, but should the worst happen, please tell Mum and Dad that I love them. You can still feel the authority and fear of this building. It might be a good thing that it's been dismantled. But I have a feeling that the ghosts that still reside here will continue to be haunted for a long time to come. The developers are moving in and eventually Pentridge will fade away amongst a sea of bars, restaurants and upmarket housing estates. But as long as there is Bluestone in Coburg, 
the ghosts and memories of this fearful place will continue to make its presence felt. If you're looking for a takeaway message from all of this, it's probably the fact that we are all masters of our own destiny, and it's up to us to choose which path we take. Otherwise, we might end up here. You might be asking yourself, how does he know so much? Well, that's easy. I, in fact, was the author of those letters. Sometimes I'm happy Sometimes I'm sad Sometimes I'm on clover And then things look bad But that's how it goes, love When I get no mail For my love's in prison, in pantry jail. 